we're pleased to have another session of the Mixotrophs and Mixotrophy Working Group uh, public webinars. Um, and he, today we're, um, our theme is uh, Mixotrophs and Global Change. So we're really happy to have uh, Professor Sarah Princiata from Penn State University present. Um, Sarah is an aquatic microbial ecologist, and today she will be uh, speaking to us about mixotrophy under climate change scenarios, insights from dinobryon species. Take it away, Sarah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I imagine I was muted for a second. Okay. So thank you for uh, inviting me to take on a little piece of a big topic, which is how mixotrophs respond to global change. And I'm going to take that today from a unique perspective for this group, which is fresh water, but I hope you'll still enjoy it. So I just want to acknowledge to start that this work was done um, when I was at Temple University, which is in Philadelphia, under the supervision of um, Bob Sanders. And I had great lab support from the folks listed here. So I thought I would give a plug and give an embarrassing photo of him, but luckily he's not here to see it. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna approach this talk uh, from a inland water perspective, but um, because freshwater lakes and inland waters in general are generally thought of as sentinels or um, canaries in the coal mine for global change. They really respond well to climate, climate influences. Um, and a lot of the same theory for these does apply in marine ecosystems. So the graphic on the left is from a review from Woolway, um, and it highlights these noteworthy ecosystem responses um, as they're related to changes in global climate, markedly like increases in uh, warming. Um, so you're probably well aware of a lot of these. So I've taken the data from this paper to show you the top three. Um, to highlight that um, under changes in global climate, we're going to have lakes having losing ice cover and having shorter durations of ice cover. Also, earlier ice break off and later ice on. Um, we also will probably have changes to mixing regimes, so longer periods of thermal stratification and also earlier stratification. A lot of lakes um, in the northern hemisphere, at least, those that are dimictic are often changing to monomictic, so mixing twice to mixing once. Um, and finally, the most obvious change is a warming with in surface water temperatures by about 0.34 degrees um, between the period of 1985 to 2009. So all of these uh, ecosystem responses are going to have a big impact on mixotrophs and mixotrophy. And I'm really interested in um, these impacts on mixotrophs and mixotrophy from a phenological perspective. So you have a cascading series of events um, in many inland waters, where which is often driven by climate and then density differences between the water masses. And so you, at least this image, this is from Hillary Dugan. She's at University of Wisconsin. She made this, this figure. Um, and so this shows what a classic dimictic lake looks like um, through seasons where you can alternate between mixing periods and then periods of thermal stratification. And so a lot of these different uh, areas are going to either promote or even prohibit grazing activity, which has really important implications for uh, carbon cycling because mixotrophs, of course, we know act as producers and consumers. So something that I thought would be fun would be, um, so I put numbers here uh, for the different depths and different times of year. I actually can't see the chat, so I someone will have to tell me what people are saying. Um, but I thought it would be great for people to list some of the numbers where they think mixotrophy would be most dominant. So go into the chat. And if you think mixotrophs are going to be really common in the spring at the Limnian, you put one. If you think they're going to be common in the summer hypolimnion, you put five. There's some dispute in the chat already. <laughs> So 
So votes for five and six. Yeah, I see. A couple of votes for those. Three and seven. Three and six. Four through six. Just six. Oh, everyone loves the winter at the Limnian. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I just thought that was a fun exercise because uh, it's something I think about a lot is where will mixotropes be dominant and how will this change in light of global climate? So you can think about um, perhaps the post spring bloom might be a place where mixotropes can dominate where you there's a depletion of nutrients that they can respond well to. Um, early fall, you have reduced light period and then some early recirculation of nutrients and then of course um, winter under ice where light is greatly attenuated. And so I have the same image now and I want you to imagine what will happen under climate change scenarios. So we might have warmer surface waters which will extend periods of thermal stratification. Um, that's going to result in longer periods of exposure to potentially saturating light. And then you might also have a reduced recirculation of inorganic nutrients or maybe some type of stoichiometric imbalance. And a lot of these situations can promote grazing. Um, if you have extra heat absorbed in surface waters um, during at least the open water period, a lot of times you will have delayed ice formation um, and then that can have consequent effects into the uh, open water season. So there's a really obvious question here about how different environmental conditions will influence the trade-offs between the mixotrophic strategies and what that means for their competitive abilities against specialists. And there are a lot of great studies that test this, but I think we need more to look for synergy between different amniotic factors. And so there's just a little bit of evidence um, that phenology matters. So this is uh, an older paper that I, I published, but nevertheless, um, it shows the results of some field work that I did in a small legal mesotrophic system. A picture of it is in the corner here. Uh, and I looked at vertical donation in mixotrophs, heterotrophs, and phototrophs. These are nanoflagellates, so they're constitutive forms. Um, and I looked at that as a function of water column structure. And so um, in this image, the you see periods of mixes and then periods of thermal stratification. And then the mixotrophs are depicted with the green and heterotrophs in red. I know that might not be super evolutionarily uh, right if I think about chloroplasts, but anyway. Um, so when the water column is mixed, there was no differences between their grazing rates. But when the water column was thermally stratified, um, mixotroph grazing exceeded heterotrophs in the surface waters and the metalimnetic waters. So um, uh, phenology does matter. So I am supposed to be talking about temperature, so, which is one of the root drivers, a lot of these ecosystem level changes. So we know that temperature plays a fundamental role in the physiology of all organisms, mixotrophs included. And it's well established that a lot of metabolic, all metabolic reactions have these thermal reaction norms. We have some optimal thermal tolerance um, length by a critical minimum and maximum. I've demonstrated that here um, in some work with my favorite mixotroph, which is denobrian. Um, so you just see its growth rate when it's acclimated to higher low light over temperature, right? Um, and you can expect that different metabolic processes are going to have different temperature sensitivities. And this is really important for organisms that mix trophic modes, right? And they rely on various degrees to heterotrophic or autotrophic processes. And the metabolic theory of ecology has been used to develop. And then there's great support for the hypothesis that mixotrophs are going to become more heterotrophic with increasing temperature. And this is, um, I took this image from work by Suzanne Wilkin, um, and then others in Holly Muller's group have also done very similar studies that support this metabolic theory of ecology, right? In that um, it's rooted in the idea that heterotrophic processes have a higher activation energy 
and then they're going to respond more strongly to changes in temperature compared to autotrophic processes, which has really big implications for carbon cycling. Right, so under warmer temperatures, you might expect mixotrophs to capture less carbon dioxide. And so um, at the time of this work, I was really curious about um, how these predictions would hold for, so I was really inspired by Suzanne Wilkins' work, and I wanted to see if how this would hold for something on the phototrophic end of the spectrum. So we know that mixotrophs, um, at least the constitutive forms, exist along a gradient of strategies. Um, this work by Suzanne was done in a primarily heterotrophic mixotroph, um, but I was curious about what about something that is primarily phototrophic and only uses grazing to supplement uh, carbon or, or nutrient limitation. And so I did this work in Denobrian. It's a, I like to call it a cosmopolitan mixotroph. There are surely marine strains of it, um, but it's more on the photosynthetic end. Um, I created P uh, versus I curves, so photosynthesis irradiance curves first under three temperatures. Um, these are fitted to an Ellis Peters light limitation model. I've put the uh, verbiage up in the corner. Um, and it, so it estimates photosynthesis as a function of photosynthetic rate um, and then gives you an optimal irradiance for that. And also gives you this beta term, which estimates um, photo inhibition. So the curve here, this is for de brain at three temperatures, 12, 16, and 20. And this was done in the laboratory situation, of course. And as you would expect, maximum photosynthetic rate for denobrian varied with irradiance and temperature. And I've listed the, uh, t the, the temperatures of which I studied, and then they're listed from highest optimal irradiance to lowest, or sorry, highest Pmax, photosynthetic maximum to lowest Pmax. And so you can see that the highest photosynthetic rate occurred at 16 degrees and just four degrees lower at 12, you had not only a lower, um, photosynthetic maximum, but also reached at a much higher light uh, irradiance. And so this kind of speaks to the photosynthetic efficiency at uh, 16 degrees at that at that kind of moderate temperature here. And then I've highlighted the beta term. The beta is significant, but only for 20 degrees. So we had photo inhibition happening at 20 degrees. So I'm next going to show you um, some graphs that look very similar, but I measured photosynthetic rate with C14, and then I also measured grazing for denobrian at these temperatures and different light levels that were informed by some field work. Um, so one of the things you might notice is these temperatures are quite low, and these light levels are quite low, and that's because uh, these this is where we found it, at least in this lake that we worked in. So this is carbon fixation as a function of temp. Um, dark bars are the lowest light level, gray bar is a medium light, and then the white bars are the highest light that we studied. And I've highlighted here in blue and yellow the medium and high light levels. And you can see that uh, we call these light saturated conditions. And what happens is as the temperature increases, photosynthesis generally increases too. Um, and that fit theory in that when light is saturating, Photosynthesis is often regulated by uh, temperature. So what's going to be limiting here is the dark reactions, and those are most mostly temperature dependent. So this, this made sense. But then when I highlight the lowest light level here, you see photosynthesis um, is really the same across all the temperatures here. And we call this a light limited condition. And we see that the this again fits theory that the photosynthetic rates are insensitive to temperature here. And that's because the light dependent reactions, things like electron transport will be really important here. And those are limited by light rather than uh, rather than temperature. So this graph looks, uh, it's the same setup, but this is grazing rate. So I measured back to river rate. So this is ingestion of bacteria. This is hourly rates. Again, at low, medium and high light levels across four temperatures. And I'll highlight again in blue and yellow these higher light levels. And what I want you to see is that grazing was the same across all these temperatures um, at these two highest light levels. But then when you look at the lowest light level, and I've highlighted it in red, you can see that grazing rate actually is the highest at 12 degrees and then decreases there on, right? So at the low light levels, we have the highest grazing rate at this moderate lower temperature, which is 12 degrees, and then it decreases till 16 and 20. And so what you can see is when I put these 
the photosynthetic rate and the grazing rate next to one another, uh, it suggests that under low light, the no brain is probably compensating for reduced photosynthesis um, by maybe supplementing carbon. Um, and it also looks like it suggests that this is a departure from the metabolic theory of ecology. And then when you do these kind of um, back of the envelope calculations to look at carbon from back to rivery at different temperatures and light levels, and I've highlighted some interesting things here, um, you see that carbon from grazing is highest actually at the lowest temperatures relatively. It's really important under low light, but also under low temperature. And so um, it is a departure from the metabolic theory of ecology. And so you might expect if we would go all the way back to that, uh, that graphic that showed the dimectic lake and I had you think about when mixotrophs were important, you might think that under low temperatures and low light, they might be grazing a lot. Um, so I just wanna show you um, a little bit about why this gets super complicated. So this is some work I did in that same um, dimictic lake in the northeastern part of the United States. And this is um, abundance on the left and grazing rate daily on the right for Denobrian under three light level, uh, sorry, three depths. So this is field work. So this is um, not species specific. This is all Denobrian in that genus. Um, and I've highlighted that the abundance of Denobrian actually is quite high in the epilimnion under winter conditions. And um, it happened, so this was, this field work was done quite a bit ago, embarrassingly, um, but the, um, in these winter conditions, we it was ice covered for most of these sampling points. So denobrian is really common under ice, as you would expect, but the grazing rates weren't really substantial. Um, so there's a lot more happening here uh, that I think is important to work towards. But either way, it looks like mixotrophy can contribute to maintaining winter populations that face really uh, prolonged periods of irradiance or reduced irradiance. Sorry. Right, so uh, to close, uh, I want to say that this is a really active area of research that's going really interesting places. So there's been a lot of great work um, that look at the balance of trophic modes um, and that validate this uh, metabolic theory of ecology that mixotrophs become more heterotrophic with rising temperature. But of course, there's even more recent studies that show that there's a departure. So we have lots to do. So I want to thank uh, the M and M group for inviting me, and I'm happy to take questions. I went way under time. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Any questions for this uh, for Sarah at this time? I have a question. Um, thank you for sharing your research. I think that was a great talk. Um, so that bit that you mentioned at the end there about the field work um, and the ice covered lake, I was wondering um, what you think the the relationship with the lab experiments might be, because I would think that if we're saying that it's light limited in a system where there's like a sheet of ice on top and you would still see low mixotrophy, I was wondering if you had like thoughts about that. It, yeah, I, I don't, I actually don't know what what's happening there. This uh, The lab experiment was done with one species, like a lab isolate, um, whereas the field work, I didn't look at any individual species within the genus, so it could be species specific response, right? So like maybe the lab isolate that I've had has been in culture for so long that it's not really representing what happens in the field. That's one of the only things I can think about, but yeah, I, I, that's a really good question about what could be happening that if, or maybe they just don't need to graze that much to sustain themselves, right? Like maybe they are grazing, they are there, but they don't need to eat a lot uh, to support their photosynthetic function. Thanks. Nicole, I see that you have your hand raised. Yeah, Sarah kind of touched at the very end when she was responding to that last question, my question, and that's going back to like, uh, I guess, older 
uh, older theoretical models for for mixotrophs. The idea that as like if a the mixotroph is responding more to nutrient limitation, then as light levels decrease, their ingestion rates will decrease because they're not photosynthesizing as much essentially. And I was just yeah wondering, have you has anyone or have you looked at like nutrient responses, changes in nutrient responses for denobrian? Yeah, you know what? This would have been a great time for me to put that slide at the end of the slide deck, and I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I thought was like, okay, so why eat bacteria basically, right? If these grazing rates are actually pretty low. Um, in the lab isolate, when I reduce nitrogen and phosphorus and also modify the nitrogen and phosphorus ratio, they ate more. So it's definitely, um, there's also a nitrogen phosphorus. They're perhaps eating not only to support uh, reduced photosynthetic efficiency and carbon fixation, but also probably to acquire NMP. Yeah. And again, right. this is one isolate, so much more to do. Always. <laughs> Karen, I see that you have your hand up. Um, yeah, there was so much good stuff in there, Sarah. It was like my brain wasn't working fast enough to unpack all the these <laughs> tidbits. But one thing I was wondering about is um, where you saw, saw like a maybe a lower grazing rate or lower bacteria in the winter in the epilimnion than maybe we would have thought if mixotrophy or heter in that case more heterotrophic behavior was supporting um denobrian uh i wonder if correcting that for the temperatures i'm assuming it's pretty pretty cold and i wonder if just like a depressed metabolic rate overall could account for a lower grazing rate and like if it was corrected or normalized to a temperature effect you would actually see that the grazing rate is pretty high that's a really good point i wish i thought of that that's a, yeah, that's a great idea. Probably it's quite cold at this time. What 4 degrees probably see. Right um, in this study in general, I actually saw mixotrophs. Having higher graz grazing rates with temperature, so higher temperature, they were having higher grazing rates, but I didn't pull. Denobrian out that's a good point that if this was corrected. It actually might be quite high considering. How metabolically softened they are. That's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your talk. All right, well, if there are no other questions, then maybe we can move on to, we can thank Sarah again um, and uh, move on to our second speaker. Sure, can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, so, I'm um, really happy to uh, welcome Marco Calderini, um, who is a graduate student from the University of Evla Skula. Sorry, I uh, from Finland. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming to to speak on, speak to us um and today he will be presenting on his uh, uh 2022 molecular ecology paper metabolic plasticity of mixotrophic algae is key for their persistence in browning environments marco take it away yeah thank you jessica thank you very much for inviting me um yeah before i start i think for full disclosure i have to say that i'm not an ecologist <laughs> I, I'm actually a biochemist, so my my perspective about like the, the results that I will be presenting is probably slightly different to well, the, the the previous presentation by Sarah. Uh, but yeah, we can we can start. Um, I guess I need to ask every time I need to go to the next slide, right? Because I don't have access to that. Yeah. Okay, so. To give you a bit of the context of um, why did we do uh, why did we do this this uh, research and why were we interested in in this kind of results? It's because of well a process that is commonly referred as as browning, um, and it refers to the increasing in dissolved organic carbon concentration uh, in in waters. And I'm I'm almost sure that in coastal waters in, in some parts of the world is also a problem, but we are focusing in freshwater ecosystems, more specifically in, in lakes. And at least in the Northern Hemisphere, I think that there has been a, 
a consistent trend of increasing this organic carbon concentration, but at least in, in Fenoscandia uh, and in Finland more specifically, uh, it's kind of a problem. And it, it's really, really common to have this kind of like high DOC lakes with very, very uh, dark uh, water. And of course, brownification is, or like brown is a very complicated process that involves a lot of like moving parts. But um, the simplest way I can put it is there's organic carbon um, in these kind of like very complex kind of molecules in the catchment areas uh, of lakes. So then when it rains or because of some other like environmental processes, these uh, molecules basically diffuse into the water and, and they end up shading the water by, by changing the color. And as you can see on the bottom right, like the water color changes quite, quite a bit with, with increasing the organic carbon. So of course that will have an impact on the light availability, but it also increases the concentrations of tons and tons of molecules. And at least um, the hypothesis was that, um, well, we have like a decreasing in light availability that will shape phytoplankton communities and, and biomass because of course we have like less light available for photosynthesis. Uh, but there was no like consistent evidence of what can really happen and, and why. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, no, uh, as I said, this will shape phytoplankton communities and and well, it's expected to have like a, a very big impact at the whole like food web. Um, <laughs> I mean, at the, at the scale of the food web. And specifically what my research group does is that we studied certain biomolecules present in phytoplankton that are very important for the transfer of, of energy and, uh, well, and carbon and, and mass through aquatic food webs. And to be honest, I had no idea like how in depth I have to like introduce these kind of, this kind of molecules, but we focus on fatty acids and, and sterols. And so if I can go to the next uh, slide. Yeah, so, Fatty acids, um, I mean, if we think about like the fatty acid composition of, of different phytoplankton species, they vary quite a bit. Um, there's big differences between phytoplankton groups. Those are like the main, main differences where that we can classify phytoplankton groups based on fatty acid composition, but also there's a lot of between species uh, variation. And the same happens for, for sterols. There's, there's quite a bit of difference. And the thing is that both in laboratory experiments, but also under natural conditions, it has been shown that certain fatty acids, mostly the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, and certain kind of sterols are, let, let's call them like high nutritional quality. And probably you have heard, I mean, if you're like completely unaware of, of these kind of things, you have heard that, I don't know, for example, that fish oil is, is very good for, for health and even for like human health and it's taken as a supplement. And it's because of like some of these, these fatty acids, mostly, EPA and DHA, which are very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. And they are not only, well, let's say, um, essential or important for human nutrition, but they are very, very important in, in aquatic food webs and they are like highly retained at, at very different trophic levels. So basically by having this process of, of browning and by having this shading effect on lakes, it shapes phytoplankton communities, it changes biomass, by changing the population, we have, well, differences in the fatty acids and sterile compositions, but also we could have like differences at the cell level because, well, environmental change drive like adaptations or like plastic responses at the, at the cell level that could affect the availability of these high quality or like high nutritional quality biomolecules for higher trophic levels. And basically that is what my, my research group uh, studies. How does, or, or how do, uh, phytoplankton produce these kind of biomolecules and how do they move across food webs and, and differences in environmental conditions and well, what, what's the effect of that in, in their availability. So if we can go to the next slide. <laughs> yes, so this is a, um, a study done in, in Sweden where they also have like this, well, this very important like browning trend. And what they looked at is how are phytoplankton populations across like different uh, DOC concentrations, right? So the more DOC, remember, like the, the higher the browning and the darker the water. So I, I'm not gonna go into like the specifics of this study, but the important thing to know is that when they studied like high DOC lakes, in this case, it was like around 12, 20 milligrams of, of carbon per liter, which is like the, the unit that is commonly used to measure like DOC. 
uh, they saw that the populations were, or like the, the phytoplankton communities were relatively stable and they were mostly uh, dominated by chrysophytes and cryptophytes. And that when they fertilize, like what's in like these lakes, when they added like uh, inorganic nutrients, they saw that like phytoplankton communities did not change, but the dominating phytoplankton, uh, they just like increased their, their biomass, meaning that, well, it's very likely that they have like certain trends um, that make them well be well adapted to those kind of environments and basically they they don't have like that much competition under those kind of like high light limitations so if we can go to the the next slide <laughs> so well the question that we had uh, of course cryptophytes and chrysophytes we have like tons and tons of species uh, but we were especially interested in cryptophytes because they are considered as very, very high quality uh, in terms of fatty acids and, and uh, sterols. Uh, and most likely if you read any kind of like laboratory experiment where they are trying to grow zooplankton, it, it's very likely that they are using like cryptophytes as kind of like the, the control high quality food um, to see the effects of what, whatever like nutritional condition. So yes, we, we were interested in what is driving or like the mechanisms behind the, the success of cryptophytes in like high DOC lakes. Um, Oh, well, we, we knew already that cryptophytes are, well, considered like very poor competitors for nutrients. So it, it's it's very common for them to, to be mixotrophic, like specifically um, to have like phagotrophic uh, capabilities. So if we can go to the next slide. And well, the, the main question for us was, of course, um, if browning or if high DOC concentrations affects uh, the nutritional quality. And I'm not going to get into the details, but we can discuss uh, later why we would think uh, these kind of things. But basically, light can regulate fatty acid um, <laughs> fatty acid profiles in, in algae. But also, well, if they were using like organic carbon to grow, maybe like there was like some some kind of like effect because of that. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, okay, I'm. It's kind of like mixed together. Can you go to the next one? I don't know what's happening. Mm. Is it kind of like frozen for everyone or just for, for me? Um, it might be on your end. So the second slide I went to is algal growth and the first one with the um, two figures on it. Okay. Okay, there, there should be like a slide with the, the experimental design, but we can keep it like in this one uh, yep. otherwise. Yep, I'm on oh, yeah, experiment yeah. design now. Okay, okay, yeah, because before I was just seeing like what it says like autotrophic and those kind of things, yeah. like mixed with the previous one. Sometimes uh, know, the images are slow to load over the WebEx. Okay, okay, no, no problem. But yeah, we use, um, yeah, Cryptomonas SP, kind of like as a, because we, we have cultured it before in, in the lab. So we know that it, it grows relatively easy. <laughs> and well, one of the important things is that this, this species was originally isolated from like a clear water lake, meaning that we did not expect it to have any like long-term adaptation to like light limitation, at least like under natural conditions. So yeah, we grew it under completely autotrophic conditions that we will be calling control. Um, then, well, I know that the definition of mixotrophy is kind of like, well, it, it depends a bit on, 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 on how do you define it. But in our case, we define it as whatever way that we can use organic carbon together with, um, with inorganic carbon and with photosynthetic activity. So in this case, this is kind of like the enhanced, I don't know, mixotrophic conditions because we, we supplement it with, with glucose. Then we had a completely heterotrophic control, so glucose supplementation, but under complete darkness. And then we had like a, a, a DOC gradient in which this was a combination of kind of like a DOC extract that we prepare from peat, uh, which is kind of like a very common soil type in, in catchment areas of flakes in Finland. Uh, and it, it was like mixed with lake water. So trying to represent the biome um, that is available in, 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 in lakes here. And it was mixed with like a clear water lake uh, water. So then we, we, we could create like this kind of gradient from 1.5 to 90 milligrams of carbon per, per liter. 
this. If we can go to the, the next slide. So yeah, the, the first thing that, that we looked at is, okay, how, how well can these, these species grow across these, these different conditions? And the first thing that should um, well, be, be very obvious for you is that under, uh, well, the dark in this case, but under like light limitation or completely heterotrophic conditions, uh, this species is not able to, to grow at all. So basically it, it really needs, um, well, it, it needs to do photosynthesis to sustain growth. But then when we looked at the, the increase in DOC concentrations um, or like the DOC gradient that we prepared, you see that, well, at least we don't see like any negative effect of shading. So remember that we increase con DOC concentration, we increase the shading and like there's less light availability. And actually in some of the treatments we even got a statistically significant uh, increase in, in the growth compared to, to control conditions. And then the glucose supplemented treatments. So basically the easily available uh, organic carbon was like the highest growth that, that we saw. So if we can go to, ah, and uh, one thing that I almost forget to mention is that in order to avoid uh, inorganic carbon um, limitation during the, the growth, we added like weekly inorganic carbon uh, to all the DOC <laughs> treatments and the control conditions and to the glucose supplemented, we, we just added like the same amount of carbon in, in the form of glucose. And another thing is that for all the DOC treatment, uh, this will become like well, more obvious like later on, but um, the inorganic carbon that we added, it was like labeled with 13 carbon for something that I will be explaining a bit later. But yes, now, now, we, can, now we can go. And yes, the first thing that we checked was the, the nutritional value. Uh, as I said before, we checked, I mean, we narrowed the scope of nutritional quality as fatty acids and, and sterols. But if we can go to the next slide. So in terms of fatty acids, um, on the left, we have the, the proportion of each fatty acid, or at least like the, the algal fatty acids. And then on the right hand, the, the two plots represent like the, the content per cell, uh, like the sum of well, omega-3 and then omega-6 fatty acids. And of course, this is just like a subset of the fatty acids present in the algae. But the thing is that in the DOC mix and in, in the bacteria that we added, um, of course, there is like overlapping fatty acids. So we looked at the, the more like high nutritional quality and the fatty acids that we know that are only present in, in the algae and not in the well, in this mixture of things that, that we added. <laughs> but yeah, uh, as you can see, there's no, no differences. I mean, there's slight differences uh, between treatments, but not even statistically significant. And if we go to the next slide. And then in sterols, it's a bit different. Um, and to be honest, we, we don't have like a good explanation. We have like some hypothesis of why this happened. But as you can see, uh, if we compare like control and glucose treatment, there's no difference in terms of the sterile composition, but also in the, the content per cell. But in the DOC treatments, um, in terms of content, there's like a, well, overall like a, like a higher content, statistically significant for three other treatments, but overall there, there's like slightly higher contents and uh, the contribution, it, well, or like the, the composition of sterols, it's also like slightly different where we have like a bit of ceto, beta cetosterol, but beta cetosterol is, uh, well, it's one of the steps in the synthesis of stigma sterol. So it, it could be like more accumulated just because we are accumulating like more, or like we are producing more uh, stigma sterol. So if we can go to the next slide. And now it's when, well, the, the thing that we did, which is adding this uh, carbon 13, well, labeled inorganic carbon, is where, where it's gonna make more sense because we try to study um, how is, well, the utilization of inorganic carbon, if, uh, if that can give us some, some clue of what's happening. So if we go to the next slide. <laughs> and, and here are the results. So basically by the end of the experiment, we extracted lipids and those lipids were then separated based on polarity and we got like a phospholipid enriched fraction. Um, and the reason why we, we studied that is because um, phospholipids are usually associated with growth uh, and because the phospholipids are relatively quickly degraded uh, when cells uh, start to die. So 
by looking at that, we 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 well, we make the assumption that by looking at phospholipids or like phospholipid enriched enriched fractions, we are looking at carbon or like um, the the place where carbon is going when we have like active growth and and active or like cells are are still viable. So what you can see, I mean, I think that the more the um, the algae absorbs this inorganic carbon and uses it to, to fix or like it's been fixed and it, it's been like channeled to, to membranes, um, the higher this value is. So what we see is that with increasing this organic carbon concentration, we have a, a reduction in the utilization of inorganic carbon. So basically less photosynthetic activity. And this is the results of a, well, like a two source mixing model uh, to kind of like quantify how much of that of how much inorganic and how much organic carbon is being used. And well, in here, the thing that we did is that we established like VOC 1.5 as like the most autotrophic or like phototrophic conditions. And what we see is that when we increase from VOC 1.5 to 90 milligrams um, of carbon per, per liter, almost like a 40% of the carbon uh, is coming from, well, from the VOC extract and not from the inorganic carbon that we are supplementing. So if we can go to the next slide. And then kind of like to dig into the mechanisms behind this or behind these changes, we did like a transcriptomic analysis and we analyzed the control DOC 1.5 to 90 and then the, the glucose to see really like the differences. And all the results that I will show, it's just a comparison between one of the treatments that is being, that's been shown against the, the control. So if we can go to the next one. So just, this is like the raw data, and this is like the number of upregulated and downregulated uh, transcripts that we got. And as you can see, you see increasing the solid organic carbon uh, increases like the amount of transcripts, which by itself, it doesn't tell us much, but it just says that, well, cells are responding to something, right? The, the conditions are very, very different, so cells are responding. And glucose supplementation under like the phototrophic conditions, so under like, also changes a bit the expression, but not as much as well, like VOC90, for example. If we can go to the next one. So then, well, since there was, um, well, there, there was evidence that this species was um, able to do like phagotrophic activity, at least it is a trait that is like relatively, <laughs> um, or it, it has been seen in, in cryptophytes. That's why we, with this transcriptomic analysis, try to like dig into that to see if that was like the mechanisms behind these, these adaptations or like these plastic, plastic responses. And for that, um, well, the, um, the genes that were like differentially expressed between each one of these treatments and the control, we looked into, um, well, like how, like the description of those genes, so in which pathways uh, and in which kind of like activities they are related to. So here we, we are focusing in, um, well, like pathways that are related to like phagotrophic activity, which is for example, like lysosomes, phagosome and, and endocytosis. And as you can see, there's like a, an increasing number of like upregulated genes in, in these, these gene categories uh, when we increase in DOC. But when we have like, glucose supplementation, uh, we don't see like that much activity in these genes. So if we can go to the next one. Okay, so finally, I, I hope that, I mean, it's for the rest of the, the people, you can see it better than that I can see it, but this is a, a, a pathway reconstruction analysis. <coughs> uh, and again, we focus mostly on the um, genes related to like the metabolic uh, responses that we would expect from like phagotrophic activity and from utilization of organic carbon. And well, the, the green stuff represents the, the genes related to the chloroplasts. So the light dependent and independent uh, genes. Then we have like the mitochondria, mostly focusing on like the TCA cycle. Uh, then we have the glucose degradation pathway. And then on the corner, on the, like the left corner, uh, upper corner, we have the same gene categories that I showed before, but well, here we are summarizing um, just the expression levels uh, and it's like the average expression level uh, instead of having like the, the, all the number of genes. And as you can see, well, all these treatments, so all the DOC and the glucose supplementation on average and in general, um, they downregulate photosynthesis, which was, I mean, kind of like expected. 
But then the biggest difference that we have is that in, in terms of like the genes related to like the TCA, we see uh, uh, quite high, um, well, higher expression levels in the DOC treatments, but not in the glucose uh, supplementation. And then we have, of course, in these, these kind of like gene groups uh, related to like uh, phagotrophic activity, we also see them like a high expression with increasing DOC, but not so much with, with glucose. So at least the interpretation of this result for us is that, well, like the, um, uh, the script of Cryptomonas SP is, um, well, it's doing phagocytosis, it's ingesting bacteria, and it's channeling most likely, um, well, like the proteins, proteins are like then degraded, and the, the carbon backbones and they're being channeled to like the TCA cycle. And that's why we should, or, like, we are seeing like this kind of results and this overexpression of the genes related to the TCA cycle. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so the last thing that, that we looked at is uh, the pigment composition and the, the, the pigment contents because since we saw a, a, well, a, a down regulation of photosynthesis, we would have expected to see perhaps uh, some change in photosynthetic pigments. But as you can see, that's not what, what we saw uh, in terms of carotenoid contribution and, and well, content per chlorophyll <coughs> and also chlorophyll A contents, uh, they were not different. I mean, and actually in, in DOC90, they were like even higher than, than under control conditions. So this shows that, I mean, even though that we cannot um, combine all results together, or, or it would be nicer if they were like a bit uh, lower contents. But this shows that this species at least uh, requires photosynthetic activity. And perhaps because of the shading effect that we're having, there's kind of like a compensation mechanism to increase, or like at least to maintain relatively high um, chlorophyll contents. But of course, I mean, again, uh, under glucose supplementation, uh, we don't see this so, um, I don't know. It's it's just like one interpretation and one possibility. Um, but yes, if we can go to the the next slide. So yeah, the the, the conclusions and what what can we really extrapolate uh, at least for for what well, lakes in in Fenoscandia? Well, most likely, like when we have like very intense browning, there will be this this very strong like shading effect. So this will likely select for for mixotrophic phytoplankton <laughs> and. Kind of like the, the, well, the consequence of this is that aquatic food webs in general will be or will become more um, reliant on, on bacterial production. So the mechanism could be that DOC uh, is degraded partially by bacteria. Then we have like this outgrowth of bacteria in populations. And then we have like phytoplankton, which is like predating on bacteria. So we will decrease photosynthesis, which of course changes the, um, the carbon cycling of like northern lakes and we have like much more reliance on bacterial production <laughs> but at least um, as i said like from my research group perspective this shouldn't be um well super negative in terms of fatty acids and and, and sterols or in terms of like this kind of like high nutritional quality fatty acids and, and sterols because at least cryptophyte and also like chrysophytes are relatively like high quality or like high nutritional quality foods so at least in, in that perspective, it, it shouldn't get like highly affected by, by browning and, and some future increases in these organic carbon concentrations. But yeah, that is what, what I wanted to present to you. The, the last slide is just uh, my research team uh, or the, the team that I'm working for. Um, so yeah, thank you very much again for, for the invitation and I hope that this was interesting for you. Thank you so much, Marco. That was very impressive. Are there any questions from this group? Uh, yes. Ricky, go ahead. Yeah, I'm still trying to digest the idea that you didn't see changes in the photosynthetic pigments. Was that, mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't get the slide quick enough. Was that in the concentrations? Yes, so we had, I mean, there, there were like three uh, figures. One was like chlorophyll A concentration, which there was like no difference, or only like DOC 90, so very high DOC concentrations. It had like higher chlorophyll A concentrations. Then we had 
carotenoid composition in terms of like the ratio of different carotenoids, which can also be an adaptation. And we did not see any difference. And then we had like the ratio of um, the quantity of each carotenoid relative to like the chlorophyll uh, content. And also, I mean, again, there were like a lot of variation obviously between treatments, but, but no difference, meaning that, yeah, at least in terms of like those pigments, there's no big difference. One of the things that, that we tried to study, but we had like a, well, we had like problems with the protocol was that cryptophyte have like a different kind of pigments too. I don't know if you have ever heard of like um, ficobilins, which is kind of like proteins that associated to photosynthetic membranes and they can like harvest light. And <laughs> um, actually, yeah, the, the, the color of cryptophytes is partially explained because of that, that pigment. And we don't have data on that. So it, it, it is possible that because there's like um, well, lower light availability, they increase this pigment more, or this like protein slash pigment to harvest light, which has like, well, different properties. So it can harvest light from like a different um, section of the, the, the light spectrum. So that's one of possibilities that unfortunately we, we could not cover in the, in the study. Yeah, thank you. And I was also thinking, I don't know if this is anywhere accurate, but normally I think of mixotrophy as kind of like a pick and choose. You can put more energy towards photosynthesis or heterotrophy, but you can't do everything. Maybe because you're adding so much DOC to simulate the browning that there's no reason that they need to pick either or because they can uptake bacteria and they can have as much as they want in terms of energy um, for photosynthesis. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a good question. To be honest, I, I don't know. I mean, you would expect that there will be perhaps like a partial degradation of everything related to photosynthesis, just because it's so energetically expensive to maintain like well photosynthetic membranes, but also like those pigments and and all the stuff. But at least we we did not see that. So I don't know. But most likely, if you read like different literature, you will see a, a, like a wide variety of responses. So it, it might be that we just, I don't know, the one species that we chose has like these specific adaptations, but if you study the same response to, or like this, the response to the same stimulus in another species, it could be like completely different. At least that's my, maybe Sarah can <laughs> give her perspective, but that, that, that's how I see it at least. Sarah? This is a, <clears throat> Lower my hand. That was really, really interesting work. Uh, I'm wondering if you measured bacteria levels or abundances in your um, in your treatments. Um, this is really interesting from a perspective of how you define mixotrophy, right? So, um, Cryptomonas does eat bacteria, but uh, in my experience, at really low rates. I'm just curious if you saw any depletion of bacteria over time in your treatments, like with yeah, DOC, so like you'd expect, right? That as you had more DOC, you might have more bacteria, but they might be declining because of the grazing, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's possible. I mean, it, it's it's possible. Sorry, unfortunately, we did, we did not measure it because we we tried with like a technique to. It's like a fluorescent, using fluorescence to label bacteria, but it, it did not work well. And of course we have like, I mean, when, when you put everything together and also like the DOC has like particulate matter. So when, when you try to like separate it to analyze different things, it's it's a bit complicated. Uh, but actually I, I wrote like one of your papers just to just to check like the methods that you use, because that, that's one thing that <laughs> we are really interested in, in, in developing um, in, in my lab. Like any any form, I mean, usually we measure like CO two production uh, and this kind of like well airtight flasks, but in this case, since we have like algae and well, like I don't know, extrapolating results would be like a bit more complicated. But yeah, I, I completely agree with you that it is possible that grazing also increases because there's more bacteria available, and uh, yeah, there, there's. For sure, like some dynamics, like doing the the cultivation time, that could be like affecting the results. But yeah, I mean, I I, I give you the the point.
Do you know the light attenuation that some of the treatments would have experienced? Um, so we didn't quantify it in, in the experiment, um, but the, the properties of VOC is that they decrease a lot on the, like the blue side of the, the, the spectrum. So basically the, the, the high energy part of light. Uh, and that's why, yeah, before I said that perhaps as a mechanism, they are also increasing the, the concentration of like these picobillions because those pigments can absorb more on the on the red side of the, the spectrum. Um, but yeah, we, we, we did not quantify directly. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, so typically this is the time in which we break out into breakout sessions. Um, so I'm gonna, and Holly and I were just discussing. And so what we usually do is we break out into these breakout sessions and then there's a number of questions that um, we talk about and then we come back as a whole group. Um, and so Holly just posted the link to the questions in the, in the chat. Um, but we were wondering if this group wants to just stay together in one large session for discussion Okay, I'm seeing a couple nodding heads. <laughs> it might be, that be fun because we have two experts in the room with us. And one thing that's fun about staying all together is that I think it could lead to a richer discussion from hearing Marco and Sarah's points of view in the same room. I agree. Okay, all right, let's do this. Um, uh, so, yeah, so. You should have the link to this discussion. And so we have four questions here. Maybe I'll just read them all out and then we don't have to discuss them in order, um, but I'll just read them out and then we can launch into the discussion. Okay, first, Mixotrophy has been hypothesized to provide a competitive advantage along the vertical gradient of resources created as a result of thermal stratification. Discuss the impact of surface water warming on the activity of mixotrophs and mixotrophy from a phenological perspective. And then two, several studies suggest that mixotrophs may respond to long-term warming trends by an increased re reliance on phagotrophic processes. What are the potential impacts of short-term pulses, heat waves, inflows of DOC on mixotrophs and mixotrophy? And then third, can dissolved organic carbon reshape communities towards mixotrophic phytoplankton? What are candidate molecules that increase cryptophytes growth in high DOC? And then lastly, how do we account for the gradient of nutritional strategies within mixotrophy and the inherent flexibility of the mixotrophic lifestyle in studies that assess impacts of environmental change? So who wants to who wants to get started? Which question are we all interested in first? I'm just taking a moment to digest them. Sorry. <laughs> Me too. I really liked Sarah's slide at the start where she was asking us to identify the numbered locations in a body of water where mixotrophy might become more abundant. I wonder if we can use that in the first couple discussion prompts here as a launching off point to say, okay, you know, when do we think mixotrophy is going to show up as a key metabolic strategy? What more experimental studies and things do we need to? nail that down, what's most urgent to figure out. I like that. I'm happy to share that slide. For some reason, it won't allow me. I may even have a presenter. Um, I can try to make you. Now you're a presenter again, I think. There we go. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, success. And then what I thought was really interesting is that there's multiple things changing all at once in many of these leaks. So we'll have browning and warming, for example. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. Do you think that there are cases in which there will be potential counterbalancing effects um, of, of one forcing versus the other? So um, thinking, yeah, um, if you were to have, let's say, a lake with um, uh, increased browning, in, increase nutrients, um, temperature, uh, where, where would there be, where would there be any counterbalancing there? I'm trying to think off the top of my head. <laughs> would, um, would increased, like, DOC or CDOM in a lake, that would, I'm trying to think whether that would exacerbate temperature. Like, would that, it seems like a darker colored lake would actually absorb more heat and become hotter, or is it the other way that it shades more, to less light? Like, will it be cooler at the bottom due to more color, or will it be actually warmer? That's a really good point. Uh, Eric, because um, a lot of, okay, so I'm just limiting to an area in which I'm familiar, which is the northeastern part of the United States, but there's been studies that show that uh, long-term work in lakes that are browning is that their hypolimnians, the depths are actually getting cooler, mm -hmm. like you, but like you suspect. Um, so you, yeah, darker warmer surface waters like absorbing more heat and becoming warmer and the hypolimnons are becoming cooler darker and cool well i guess they're yeah. dark way but yeah yeah maybe darker and cooler okay that's so it's interesting and yeah. i really kind of thought that the so a lot of work in lakes, right? I know this is very different in oceans, but a lot of work in lakes, and Marco can probably speak to this, kind of leaves out the hypolimnion. Um, and you'd think of the hypolimnion maybe as a, um, I thought that would be kind of a safe space for mixotropes to be. Some of them really can migrate. Um, some of them form DCMs. Um, in my experience, you don't see a lot in the hypolimnion actually, like the lack of light is probably actually prohibitive for some reason. Again, I this is just, in my experience, Marco might be able to speak to other systems and you all might be able to speak to other systems um, where the depths act as a reservoir space, like safe space for mixotropes to go. Um, mm -hmm. Lake depths also have like a lot of sulfide in them that might be toxic. Um, but there's a lot of good purple sulfur and green sulfur bacteria down there that could be good food. So um, something I like to do is think about like what's happening below the surface. And I, unfortunately, I don't think it's a good place for mixatrix and I can't imagine a change scenario where they would go down there for some reason. This is not um, a lake setting, but in um, Ricky may know the system in Rhode Island, the narrow river, it's almost like fjord like in that it's highly stratified and there's a oxic anoxic boundary. And at least for kleptoplastidic mixotrophs, we often find them right there at that boundary. And mm. it may have something to do with cryptophytes accumulating there because it's sort of a low light niche. Um, it might have to do with, you know, needing to grab some chloroplasts to help you produce oxygen in a low oxygen environment. It might have to do with behavioral 
liking boundaries. Um, but I agree with you that I think there's this tension between light limitation, the accumulation of toxic materials, um, sufficient oxygen and other resources. I was also wondering whether, you know, as Lakes Brown, obviously that would like shoal the, um, the attenuation of light. And so, you know, you'd have even less light for the hypolimnion, but it would also potentially select for more heterotrophy. So whether, you know, there's a too brown to bother photosynthesizing level. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, at least for what I know, uh, it is true what, what you're saying, but I mean, the, I think it's called like the photic zone uh, in English. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the space where photosynthesis is, yeah. is technically available uh, becomes like well s smaller or, or, or shorter just because of like the, this high DOC. But at least, yeah, in the studies that that I have uh, I have read, usually it's well mostly centered around um, what like phytoplankton, like photosynthetic uh, algae and, and primary production. Uh, and those kind of studies, at least, are are the like the mainstream. So I, I don't know how many people are really looking into that, like, like just looking at heterotrophic organisms. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, if, if I had to guess, I would say that it, it, it is an environment where they have like way less competition. Um, so it's, it's much more possible for them to, to thrive. Uh, but as I said, that, that would just be my, my guess. I, I don't have any, any data to, to back that up. Marco, do you know of any brown, like CDOM molecules that are actually toxic? Mm. Would it depend on the, it also might depend on what is being washed in, right? Is that, yeah, yeah, does that definitely. ever happen in your experience? Well, the, there's a discussion about like, yeah, DOC quality. Um, because uh, at least in the studies that I have read uh, around like this area, you have up to like five or 6,000 molecules that you can identify that are coming from DOC. So, I mean, one of the objectives of, of my study was to look at if it's really um, like phagotrophic activity, what is um, like helping cryptophytes. And it's not just the, um, well, osmotrophic acquisition of some other molecule that could be like floating around. Um, but yeah, at least we have had experiences in the lab where we add some kind of like DOC extract and then like the, the species cannot grow at all. So, I mean, there's so much stuff there that it, it is possible too that there's something that, yeah, mm -hmm. is poisonous for, for some species. Uh, but there might be like many molecules that are also like well, enhancing like growth somehow. Mm -hmm. Just that I'm thinking um, experimentally, I find it really challenging to simulate browning in the experiences I've had when I try to do that. We try to do that at large scales and it's always extremely poisonous. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I at, at least most of the, um, uh, well, like large scale experiments, they usually use, I, I cannot remember the name, but it's a compound that it just produces like shading. It's and, like lumen feed, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, is that really representative of what real browning is? Because just by, I mean, otherwise you can just put I mean, some kind of cover to to your experiment and test the effect of like light limitation. Um, right. But yeah, it's it, it's it's a really it's really complex, <laughs> a really complex experimental approach. Uh, to try to match like natural conditions to to the laboratory in this sense. I was wondering about this question about pulsed conditions. Um, so let's um, it. Um, so the expectation under climate change would be that um, extreme rainfall events would increase, and that would result in. Um, short-term browning of of lakes kind of different from chron different from the kind of chronic long-term browning is there one first is there a difference in the doc that comes into um these environments um 
from short term pulses that you know of. Um, and then second, what 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 do you, what it, what would be the expectation of what would happen if we had a, let's say, you know, one week event, one month event, um, versus the kind of slow gradual increase in DOC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question. Um... I will give you my opinion because, to be honest, <laughs> I don't have any data to to back up what I'm gonna say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, um, the the DOC quality will will depend on what is being dragged. So, for example, in in my experiment, we we focused on this kind of like PIT, uh, like I mean DOC coming from PIT, just because it's very common here. But if you consider that climate change, at least in this uh, region of the world, will also like increase. Um, well, like production in the, the surrounding areas, of course, it's going to drag like, well, leaves that are like on the, on the floor and, and those kind of things. So most likely it will depend on like the time of the year when you have like this kind of like intense, um, well, precipitation events. Uh, so perhaps like in autumn, it's mostly like, yeah, I mean, dead, <laughs> like tree material and those kind of things uh, while yeah, perhaps some other times of the year it's like slightly different. That that would be like my 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 idea. But when when you're saying yeah, this comparison between like long term and and short term, I would expect that long term there's more time for species to adapt. So you should see perhaps like a smoother transition. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because I know a research group in Canada that they they are I mean they are at the moment studying like this kind of like quick events. Because I don't know for what specific environmental conditions, but they have like this, well, perhaps they're not lakes, but they're like small ponds in Northern Canada. When after raining, the, the water goes from like clear water to like completely, completely dark. And they are studying like what kind of adaptations uh, does that like promote? Because it's really, if you have like very clear water adapted phytoplankton mm -hmm. in like one week, it can go from that to almost no light available. Um, so yeah, I, I will check <laughs> uh, the, the name of the person working in this research group, and maybe I can I can send you a paper or something. Uh, but to be honest, uh, I don't know about like their specific results, but I think it's something that it's being studied at the moment. Karen, um, I was this is I don't think this is totally tangential, but. Um, I was just thinking about what we've been seeing in the Gulf of Maine um, because we. You know, it's a, a larger system than a lake and it's marine, but it's still a semi enclosed coastal sea. And um, we, uh, it was, I think in 2022, there was a paper published uh, that showed that there was like a steady increasing concentration of sea dom. So, like a browning of the Gulf of Maine, essentially over a very long period of time. But then on top of that, we have this super high amplitude seasonal cycle where every spring we have the spring freshet, which flushes a ton of material from rivers into the coastal Gulf of Maine. And so we kind of have that color, increasing color trend over decades. And then on top of that, these high amplitude events. Um, I know from that same paper, they suggest that there's a decrease in primary production in the Gulf of Maine, coincident with that increase in color or um, in sort of CDOM concentration. So at this point, it's more hypothesis, hypothesis than anything else or just like question, but it would be really interesting to look more specifically at mixotroph, you know, things that are capable of mixotrophy in the system and, um, and then look at it, that trend versus the sort of seasonal cycle of flushing from land into the coastal coastal current. Yeah, definitely sounds something to to look up <laughs> or to look at. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, like, as you're talking about lakes, it occurred to me that we have these kinds of things in this system here. So be interesting. Yeah, you would expect that. I mean, in the case of the lakes that completely get covered, they um, the adaptive strategy would be to um, have more mixotrophs or to be more mixotrophic um, so that you can deal with the fact that you can't photosynthesize for, you know, 
a while at a time if there's a large flushing event. Um, and I wonder if there's a gradient there would you would expect a gradient in the Gulf of Maine um, from the river mouths mm -hmm. to um, the center or more like away from the coast um, uh, of more mixotroph mixotrophic species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a stupid question, but how deep? It's quite deep, right? This the Gulf of Maine. I think the deepest place is like 300 meters or 350 okay, meters. But most of it, the deep part of it is mostly around two, like 200 meters. 350 is like a few spots. <laughs> okay. So it's not, I mean, it's deeper than a lake, but it's not like ocean deep. <laughs> yeah. No, because that's a really nice place to not only to look at a gradient spatially, but a gradient vertically if they're yep. moving down um, as a protective mechanism rather than. Yeah, the away. question is how to find historic. I mean, we definitely have historic data in the surface or like at points where we have time series, but I don't know about historic data vertically. I mean, I'm sure it exists in some. I'm sure something exists, but I don't know how well resolved it is. Uh, but yeah, there there's a lot of possibility there. Maybe it's something we can workshop at our June workshop as a proposal. <laughs> Do we want to talk about any of the other questions? <laughs> Well, I can raise the elephant in the room, which is osmotrophy. <laughs> I think do it's a total. I know that for our working group, we decided to define mixotrophy as phagotrophy and autotrophy rather than including osmotrophy. <laughs> but when I hear like huge inputs of organic dissolved organic carbon, I'm wondering if cells are using it instead of inorganic carbon. You, you guys may have alluded to that in your talks and it went over my head, but. <laughs> no, no, it is, it, it is possible. And that is one of the things that, I mean, we wanted to check in, in this specific case of like Riptomon SSD, which one was like the mechanism behind the, their adaptation. But yeah, it, it, it's harder, I think, experimentally to, to test it. At least when you have like this kind of like complex mixture of things that you are adding. Um, yeah, perhaps transcriptomics could be mm -hmm. under like laboratory conditions the the best tool to use um because yeah. otherwise yeah this in my experience i i have never seen anything besides well, i don't know some labeling experiment with the like carbon 13 and, and you know what you're adding like precisely um but yeah i, I don't know if sarah has any idea <laughs> of, of how can it be studied and to make the distinction between what, what's the mechanism behind yeah, I think we need some really fine isotope labeling to do that type of work. Even the labeling is challenging because I guess it would depend on whether it's getting reworked by bacterial uptake. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have a vested interest in this because of some reviews we got back on a paper recently and it's like, how would I convince you? <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> that it wasn't just direct uptake of the OM, but yeah. So Marco, what um what would you look for in the transcriptomics? Do we have like putative genes that indicate osmotrophy? Mm, I mean, at least what, what I would look into is the um, I mean the degradation pathways. And if you have like some kind of like control condition, just try to see if there's any difference between those. I mean, of course, you need to make the assumption that, uh, well, there is some kind of like, well, complex like glucose compound, perhaps that they are able to degrade, or or there's like simple sugars, because yeah, if you go to like the, um, I mean, smaller molecules, perhaps it's like really really hard to see any like expression difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, who knows? Because at least I I, I have seen. Like laboratory studies where they use acetate. Yeah. Um, that's that's quite small. So I, I don't know like exactly which pathway to look at. Uh, 
body mm -hmm. expression. But at least if you want to make the distinction between phagotrophy and osmotro <laughs> and osmotrophic activity, if you really know that they are absorbing something or that they are using organic carbon, um, perhaps yeah, transcriptomic is like a good a good tool. So at mm -hmm. least to, to make the distinction between those two. But yeah, it, it gets complicated. <laughs> the other, and again, this is another one that as you're saying would only work in an experimental setting. The other thing I was thinking of is if you could, if the mixotrophs were able to grow azenically, you could, you know, do the test of amending in the absence of bacteria. Yeah. And But of course, as we know, with mixotrophs, there can be a lot of synergies between the different forms of metabolism. So I don't know if that's definitive, yeah, but yeah. at least it gives you a little bit of an indication. Well, but at least in theory, even if you have bacteria growing, you should be able to, um, I mean, see the difference between bacterial transcripts and your algae transcripts. Yeah. Just because mm -hmm. of like promoters and those kind of things. Agreed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that you would still get some kind of like contamination because of like those conditions. But yeah, I mean, I agree that like ideal conditions, you have like excellent cultures. But cryptomonas is nice for that because it perhaps relies a little bit less on back delivery in the scheme of things. A little bit less back to river. So you picked a good mixotrope for this. Really yeah, yeah, and <laughs> at least not one that should be like long term adapted, at least in the the cultural conditions and in the natural conditions that we chose. But but yeah, I mean, you, but you know better than me probably that you can find like the whole spectrum of <laughs> phagotrophic <laughs> capacity and uh, implementation, I guess. I feel like I've asked, asked this before of omics people. What is the um, what is the possibility of going from something like transcriptomics to rates? You mean to quantify based on transcriptomic activity or like in yeah. transcriptomic differences? Yeah. Or yeah, basically, if you, I, mm -hmm. I mean, it would, I if it would be possible to look at essentially to go from um, transcriptomic activity to rate of or proportion of metabolism uh, from a phagotrophy versus autotrophy, then you would be able to um, determine whether there's osmotrophy or how much osmotrophy is happening. But um, my understanding is that it's it's not it's not a it's not something you can get rates from, right? Not yeah. really. I okay. oh no, go for it, Marco. <laughs> um, yeah, at least in in my opinion, you, you you or at least you should not do that because there are so many steps where, I mean, think that this is just like expression, so it's kind of like the first step. I mean, before getting like the proteins and all that, so. You can have like a lot of modulation at the protein level of, of like, well, if you're just thinking about like an enzyme or yeah, there's also like options of regulating like gene expression or like before the step before, I mean, after like transcription before getting like the protein. So just by looking at gene expression, I mean, it would be such a crazy extrapolation <laughs> to just yeah. propose like a rate that, I mean, perhaps if, you, if you're lucky, it happens that they match, but I, I think you're, you're playing with probabilities too, and they are not like in your favor, I would say. <laughs> okay. okay. I can imagine, so the closest thing that I can think of would be if you measured over time, you could get a rate of the ratio of organisms that have the potential to be mixotrophic. So kind of like um, I use Lysotracker in some of my studies, so looking at the potential mixotrophy, so all organisms that are that contain phagosomes theoretically will be labeled with a dye similar to what I imagine transcriptomics would tell you is that these organisms have the capacity or they, they are using these um, mixotrophic organelles. So you can you could get like a ratio of mixotrophic to non-mixotrophic organisms and then maybe get that through time. 
but I think, um, like everyone's saying, it's kind of like a, an expression, is it there or is it not there? So you can't really see like how much they're using the genes and the proteins. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So keeping an eye on the time, um, we're right at 1230 Eastern now, 930 Pacific, which is our usual ending time. So I, Jessica, unless you have anything to add, I just want to do another round of applause for Sarah and Marco. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. And Nate, do you want to add anything? No, I just hit the wrong thing. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for being here and for such a great discussion. Jessica? Yeah. Um, thank you again. Um, let, yeah, we'll wrap up. Uh, we don't have announcement for our next webinar, but uh, the organizing committee will get together soon um, and uh, we'll set, set the next one up. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Marco, if you yes. want to um, talk about how to measure bacteria with the labeling, I'm happy to help in any mm, way. Okay. I know sometimes okay, okay, okay. reading a paper uh, doesn't fully encapsulate it, so I'm happy to help talk about techniques. Okay, okay, that, that sounds great. I, I might email you soon. <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Doing all that. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.